So um, the way this is going to work is that um, I'm going to, once I do the introductions, I'm going to go away. Megan and Connor are going to talk. And, um, and then I'll come back in in 30 or 45 minutes with questions from the audience. We'll go through those. And so if you have any questions, put them in the chat, which if you're using a computer, is going to be at the middle bottom of your screen. And um, John from the bookstore is monitoring those as well. Um, so uh, we, will, we will get to those in a little bit. Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in, here in Houston. I am so excited about today's event. I've been looking forward to it for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, anytime we have Megan Abbott on board to moderate a talk, I know it's going to be a good chat. And it's so nice to see Kenna here again today. It's been way, way, way too long. Too long. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tana French is the author of uh, seven previous books, including In the Woods, The Likeness, and The Witch Elm. Her novels have sold over three million copies and won numerous awards, including the Edgar, Anthony, McCavity, and Barry Awards, the Los Angeles Times Award for Best Mystery Thriller, and the Irish Book Award for Crime Fiction. She lives in Dublin with her family. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on. It's so nice to be kind of back with you or as close as we're going to get <laughs> in these weird times. It's so nice to see both of you guys again. Likewise. Uh, Megan Abbott is the award-winning author of nine crime novels, including the best-selling You Will Know Me and Give Me Your Hand. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Paris Review, and The Wall Street Journal. Formerly a writer on HBO's The Deuce, she is co-showrunner and co-creator of Dare Me, which recently completed its first season on the USA Network and Netflix. Her latest novel, The Turnout, will be out in summer... 2021. Hello, Megan. Hello. So glad to be here and so excited to talk to you, Tana. Oh, it's been too long. <laughs> it has been too long. And thank you so much for doing this. It's, and thank you, McKenna. It's just, it's great to be here. Um, the pleasure is all mine. So um, before I go away, I will just mention that if you, um, many of you, almost all of you, I believe, who um, are joining us today already have a copy of uh, The Searcher, but we have signed book plates available. Um, in case you need more as gifts, um, so, or, or just, I don't know, need a second copy for yourself. Anyway, I'm going to go away. Y'all have a great chat, and I'll be back in a little bit. Great. Thank you, McKenna. I think we were going to start with a, a short reading. Is that, is that um, good for you, Tana? Uh, just to, that work? Okay, excellent. Yeah, this is just a little bit from very close to the beginning of the book, when Cal Hooper, who's a retired American detective, who's gone to fix up a little cottage in the west of Ireland and live in peace, has realized that somebody is watching him and he's gonna find out who. Cal is halfway through his food when the back of his neck flares again. This time he even hears the signal that triggered it. A small clumsy scramble, almost instantly cut off, like someone started to trip into the undergrowth outside the window and then caught themselves. Cal takes another big, leisurely mouthful of sandwich, washes it down with a long gulp of beer, and wipes foam off his tash. Then he grimaces and leans forward with a belch to put his plate on the table. He pulls himself out of the chair, cracks his neck, and heads for the john, already fumbling at his belt buckle. The bathroom window opens as smoothly and silently as if it's been sprayed with WD-40, which it has. Cal has also practiced the climb onto the toilet cistern and out the window, and he manages it a lot more deftly than anyone could expect of someone his size. But that doesn't change the fact that one reason he quit being a beat cop was because he had had it with climbing unreasonable objects in pursuit of mopes doing gratuitous crap, and he had no plans to go back to that. He lands on the ground outside with his heart speeding in the old familiar hunting rhythm, his ass scraped up by the window frame, and a rising sense of aggravation. The best he's got is a piece of pipe, left over from the bathroom work and stashed in a bush. Even holding it, he feels empty-handed and too light without his gun. He stands still for a minute, letting his eyes adjust and listening. But the night is speckled all over with small noises, and he can't pick out any one that seems more relevant than the others. It's got dark. The moon is up, a sharp slice chased over by ragged clouds casting only a faint, unreliable light and too many shadows. Cal adjusts his grip on the pipe and moves with the old practice compromise between speed and silence towards the corner of the house. Below the living room window, a huddle of denser darkness crouches, motionless, 
head just high enough to peer over the sill. Cal stands carefully as best he can, but the grass all around is clear. Looks like just the one. In the spill of light from the window, he catches a buzz cut and a smudge of red. Cal drops the pipe and charges. He's going for a full tackle, planning on flattening the guy and figuring out the rest from there, but his foot turns on a rock. In the second, while he's flailing for his balance, the guy leaps up and away. Cal lunges into the near darkness, grabs hold of an arm, and hauls with all his might. The guy flies towards him too easily, and the arm is small enough that his hand wraps right round it. It's a kid. The realization loosens Cal's grip a notch. The kid twists like a bobcat with a hiss of breath and sinks his teeth into Cal's hand. Cal roars. The kid yanks free and takes off across the garden like a rocket, feet almost noiseless on the grass. Cal starts after him, but in seconds he's disappeared into the scribble of shadow by the roadside hedge. And by the time Cal reaches it, he's gone. Uh, and then things get messy. <laughs> yes, they do. Oh, that's so great. Um, I love the book so much as I knew I would. Um, I can't tell you what a gift it was getting an advanced copy. Uh, it's just like the, you know, one of the pandemic pleasures <laughs> uh, was diving in. And, and we'll have a spoiler-free conversation. Uh, a, a little, we'll be a little careful around a few certain things. Uh, but the first thing... Um, I have to say, when I saw the title, I wondered if there was a connection uh, to the American movie, The Searchers, the, which is a favorite of mine. And it sounds like indeed there is. And the more I read it, the more I was wondering at the relationship that uh, between the two. Um, for those who uh, don't know the movie, The Searcher, it's John Wayne, directed by John Ford. And he, he plays, well, um, maybe you can talk to us about you know, the, the connection for you, rather than me trot out the whole plot. <laughs> yeah, um, I had been reading a lot of Westerns around the time I was kind of bouncing ideas around for this book. And I, for one thing, I really liked them. I don't know why I'd never got into them before, but I started seeing a lot of resonances between the settings of Westerns and the West of Ireland. Like, you've got that really harsh country that demands both physical and mental toughness from anyone who wants to make a living from it. But you've also got that sense of a place that's so remote, both, both geographically and culturally, from the centers of power, that the people who live there feel like the power brokers somewhere up in the big city not only know nothing about their lives, but they don't care. And if you want to have a society that functions, you have to make your own laws and enforce them yourselves. And I started thinking about some of the tropes of Westerns and how they would do in a setting in the West of Ireland, like what would need to shift or what could stay the same. And I started, yeah, kind of messing around with those. And one of the ones I wanted to stick with was um, Stranger in Town, because he shows up in so many Westerns, he kind of rolls into the saloon with a few secrets. And you know that uh, things are going to change around him. He's going to be a disruptor. Like maybe he's going to shoot the corrupt sheriff, set the town to rights, or maybe he's going to shoot the villain and everything will go up in flames, or maybe he's going to get shot for poking his nose in where it doesn't belong, but, but he's going to be a catalyst. He's going to, yeah, unsettle all the established accepted patterns and he's going to bring hidden things to light. So, and also the, the Stranger in Town is a big thing in Irish drama as well. Like one of the great classic plays of Irish drama is the Playboy of the Western World, James. Yeah, you know, it's, it's all about the stranger who comes into town and just shakes everything up. So I thought he would be kind of a good place for the Western and the Irish literature to intersect. And I kind of borrowed bits from here and there in, in Western books, Western movies. And yeah, the, ti the title is definitely a deliberate nod to the search. That's in there. I love thinking about it, too, because Cal, the hero, you know, um, uh, is um, in some ways traditionally masculine he's a retired uh cop uh you know retired chicago cop no less and but unlike say the john wayne character who's sort of the classic in the searcher who's sort of the classic um 
um, who sort of roaming, roaming the land and uh, going into this uh, foreign territory. Um, that's true for Cal too, but Cal weirdly is going there to have a domestic life, uh, to actually build a, a, a new home for himself, right? He buys this house um, a little bit on a lark and, and uh, sort of, you know, sort of becomes um, a domestic force rather than the, the typical stranger who comes in and, uh, and shakes things up in a, in a more aggressive way. Was that part, part of it too for you, is like him trying to establish domestic roots there? Oh yeah, definitely. That was one of the things that I wanted to, one of the tropes that I wanted to twist. Cause you know, your classic stranger in town, you know, don't fence me in, no one can tie me down. I've got my, my horse and I'm just gonna keep riding off into the sunset. And he really doesn't want to ride off into the sunset because he's coming off his career as a detective has ended badly. His marriage has ended badly. He's bruised all over and he's been left feeling like after a lifetime of trying to be a good man and a steady man and of thinking that those are relatively simple things where if you know you try to do right by everybody you meet and you get stuff done then you're probably a good man but he's been left with that kind of pulled out from under him and feeling like maybe it's not as simple as all that and he's not sure whether he has the right to count himself as a good man anymore and so what he's looking for is something very simple and very steady that will stay put and not shift its parameters on him and he thinks that a small town in a place far from any of those complications far he leaving behind the place where he was a detective a husband a father if he finds a small town the rules will be simpler and he'll be able to put down roots there and get a stronger sense of himself like he's been dislocated from everything that he thought he was and from everything that was important to him he's, he's been uprooted from all of that his, his sense of self is basically smashed and he needs to put down roots in a place in order to kind of reconnect to his sense of who he is so yeah he's very much looking to be a guy who spends his time doing up this ratty dilapidated little old cottage that's it end of story but you know, it's a Western. Every retired gunslinger gets called out of retirement. Yes, it's it's. Uh, I love that element about it too. It's um, uh, you know, there's a lot of scholarly history in the U.S. about how the private detective novel here derives from the Western, right? Because it's the same mm -hmm. thing where, it whether it's the um, gunslinger who gets dragged into one last gunfight, or the the PI who's sort of retired, or the cop who. Um, you know, has one last ride and, and gets tugged back in. And I, I love how you play with that and how resistant Cal is at first to get drawn into this sort of um, local mystery. Um, uh, you know, he, he resists at several turns. It's like he keep you know, he wants to, um, um, he wants that simplicity. I think that's such a key point for him. Uh, life has gotten too complicated. The world has gotten too complicated for him. Yeah, the world has gotten too complicated for him. He was, um, I was kind of thinking a lot, I, I think all of us have been thinking about a lot about morality when I was writing this book. And one of the things is that Westerns tend to be very involved with the idea of morality, of right and wrong. And there's always an urge to, to try and make it simple, like to go, okay, this person liked a really vile comment on Twitter, they're an evil person, end of story, no further thought needed. Or this person regularly does terrible things to people, but they say they're religious, so they must be a good person, end of story, again, no further thought needed. And Westerns kind of don't play that. They're all about the fact that sometimes people find themselves in situations where they're is no right thing to do. There is no good way to deal with the situation or that mostly good people will sometimes do bad things and mostly bad people will sometimes do good things and people of every kind can find it really hard to deal with this. And, and Westerns don't try to, to explain that away. They don't try to gloss over it. They don't try to deny it. They just lay it out and let us deal with the fact that this is in fact complex and there's there's nothing to do about it. And it, it kind of meant that Cal had to be somebody who was struggling with morality in some way, both in his personal life and in his job. And the whole detective thing that you were saying, I was thinking of him as someone 
who is very uncomfortable with what he, being a detective has come to mean to him. He got into this job thinking, you know, I wanted a steady job, it's a steady job. And he likes fixing things. He's a guy who likes fixing things. And for him, when he joined, being a detective was about fixing things. But he's gradually come to realize over his time in the force that it doesn't necessarily work that way. That is not necessarily what it is, what a detective is to many people is someone who fixes things. And that it may be the case that it's not possible for him to be the guy he wants to be within that framework. So he wants to leave all of it behind. Everything that being a detective entails, he's determined to leave behind him. So when he gets dragged back into it, it is very much not what he wanted, any of this. And then he finds himself being a detective without any of the, the without any of the weaponry of being a detective, not just the gun, but also the, you know, the ability to call up a tech guy and go, can you find out what's on this guy's phone for me? Or call up records and go, I need the criminal records on these five people. He's got none of that. He's completely barehanded, out on his own, no backup. So he's, he doesn't want any of the mentality of being a detective. He hasn't got any of the trappings of being a detective, and yet he's forced into the role of detective. Yes, and, and I, I love what you're saying about, I guess, this fantasy that we often have of remote or rural or wild places as being simpler and, you know, and I love how you turn all that upside down, because if there's anything we know, it's the, it's, it actually tends to go the other way, right? If people have all, you know, in small groups lived together a very long time, the, the codes and the rituals and the communication and the history, it gets get so dense and so intricate and for an outsider to come in and presume that he's you know he's going to understand this or even know when he's being lied to or like all the all the sort of instincts a cop might have they're kind of useless in this situation yeah he doesn't know any of the codes does he because of course they've been established over hundreds of years over this deeply enmeshed community and there are little signals little codes little rules that everybody takes for granted and that he it's not only that he doesn't know what they are he doesn't even know how to begin to find out what they are and he also doesn't hasn't factored in how little choice he has like in a city you you have an awful lot of choice about how much connection you have with the rest of your community. If you don't want to have any impact on your community, pretty much like, you know, don't turn your music up loud and don't let your dog bark too much and you're more or less there. Like, But in a small rural community, you don't have that option in the same way. Lena, one of the other characters, tells Cal how the, the tone of the village has shifted since young women started being able to get good jobs, started being allowed to take good jobs they go up, they move up to the city so that the young men who are farming the land, inheriting the farms, don't have anyone to marry. And you've got a load of old bachelors getting old on farms and feeling less able to deal with the outside world, a bit more wary of the outside world. You've got fewer kids and the whole tone of the area has shifted. And to him, he's not prepared for being in a place where what seems like a very individual decision can have this huge ripple effect on the whole community. He's not prepared for being tangled into a community to the degree that he is, whether he likes it or not. Yeah, and I, I, just that point you were saying about Lena, I have this quote that I think is just what you're talking about, where she says, men with no children get to feeling unsafe when they get older. The world's changing and they have no young people to show them it's grand. So they feel like they're being attacked, like they need to be ready for a fight the whole time. And that's such a subtle, thing that I, it feels like it's sort of going on now more largely uh, to a certain extent of, of fear of um, youthful activism, say, in our current moment, or, um, or sort of an understanding of um, sort of throwing out of old binaries of, of black, white, straight, gay, like all these sort of, um, that can feel, instead of feeling like opening doors and, and uh, creating a har harmonious place, actually feel like a threat. Um, and that, that felt so timely for me, so, so prescient. I didn't even think of it in those terms. I was more thinking about um, the fact that when you have kids, I think it's it's easier yeah. to be kind of pulled outwards and be, in, 
you know, looking at what's going on in the world because you don't have much choice. You know, you've got kids who are out there and engaged with it. So even if you are maybe older and maybe more isolated, you want to know what your kids are doing. So you're going to find out, you know, what are all these old strange new terms and apps and things that the young people nowadays do be using. Whereas if you don't have somebody that you have to keep up with in order to know what they're at, I think it would be easy to feel this is all just an attack. It's a threat. It's, it's not, you know, rather than having, you know, your 20 something bopping in going, Hey dad, look what I found. There's this cool new app. You don't have that, that easy in. I think it would take more work to do it, but you're absolutely right. I think there is a sense nowadays that people are feeling quite under threat by the fact that younger generations don't seem to feel bounded by the same borderlines that were set up by previous ones. And that's a great thing. It's wonderful that they're working on this. Do we actually have to stick to this boundary? Is there a good reason why we have to stick to it? And if there isn't, they don't stick to it. And I mean, that's great, but I can see how it would feel quite frightening if you had hung some of your identity or your way of life on that boundary. It could be very, very scary and upsetting. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's such a subtle and complicated thing. And I think the 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 town with it, everything is sort of in stark relief there because, as you say, the people leaving and the opportunities being so scant. One of the other things that obviously felt very prescient to me is like. Um, you know, the sort of challenge in our moment of having like a white cop <laughs> be your protagonist. Um, and like, I wondered about how you sort of tread into that territory um, and how you, how you decide to approach it. Ah, how I, just dealing with the cop protagonist. Well, I, I, okay, I had written six detectives in the Murder Squad series. And one of the things I was, I was always really interested in was why does someone become a detective? And the multiplicity of reasons that that could be for, I mean, my narrators have become detectives for any reason from, you know, there's a huge mystery in their past lives and he's trying to compensate for not having been able to solve that one through to, hey, it seemed like a steady job and I wasn't really qualified for anything else through no order must be maintained and this is the best way to do it. So I was interested not only in the variety of reasons, but also what in what happens when someone discovers that this job does not in fact do what they thought it would do. It doesn't live up to this idealization that they had of it. And it can have much darker sides and much more complicated sides and it may not be what they thought. But after those six, one of the reason, reasons I switched to standalone with the Witch Elm was I kept thinking about how many other perspectives there are to a murder investigation. The classic one is always the detective. But there's so there's you know there's the perpetrator and there's the victim and there's suspects and witnesses, and all of these people have utterly different perspectives on the investigation. Like to them, this is not a way to restore order and have truth and justice be put in place again. This is this terrifying thing that comes barreling into their lives and overturns the whole thing. I kept thinking those those perspectives deserve a voice as well, and no matter what you do with the detective voice, once you're writing from that point of view, you are writing from the point of view of authority and implying that authority is somehow intrinsically the authoritative point of view, which sounds redundant, but you know what I mean, right? That, that just because you're in a position of, of authority, that doesn't mean that your perspective is more valid than any other. So that's why I switched with Witch Elm to somebody who is not a detective and whose perspective is at various times in the book, all of those others, he's victim, he's witness, he's suspect, he's perpetrator. And that's why with this one, I've got a detective who is very much in conflict with his own concept of what it means to be a detective and for whom that concept is not comfortable and is not what he wanted it to be and not what he thought it was. And who is trying to hold it at arm's length and trying to see which bits of it he can hold on to while still being what he would consider a good man and how to reject, is it possible to reject some parts of it and keep others? Can you do that? Or is the whole concept of being this detective something that he can't work with? So, 
yeah, I liked playing with it. I liked examining it and seeing it from the perspective of somebody who's finding it really, really problematic. Absolutely. It, it just strikes me. There's been a lot of conversation lately about um, with, with, you know, the Black Lives Matters movement and how that crime fiction um, role in sort of perpetuating notions of the, the police as, um, as the authoritative authority. And, and, um, um, and I've always thought that that sort of such that most crime fiction is actually about how this doesn't work and how complicated it is for everybody. And in some ways, lots of people are trying to do the right thing, but very necessarily isn't a clear right thing. And um, lots of uh, people are corrupt um, uh, and systems, but there are also people within there trying to sort of work within the limitations of, of all that. You know, it's, I, it's always to me, uh, most crime fiction and for the ones that I respond to most are the ones where it's kind of a mess and everyone everyone yes. is just trying <laughs> to do the best they can um, for the most part it, but it's such a in the same way you were talking about this is the opportunity to talk about issues of morality I think that the cri crime novel is such a great place to talk about these sort of real structural structural racism, structural, all these sort of problems that, that plague us. Yeah, I think crime novels are, I mean, like you said, they're inherently about the problematic. It's very unusual to find a crime novel that's about someone who both starts and finishes the book, thinking that the police are this great organization and everyone in there is on the side of good and we're all working together in harmony and restoring order. I mean, it's one thing, when you, if you go back to Agatha Christie, it's a lot simpler and more clear cut there where the police may, they're probably a little bit bumbling, but they're just trying to get things done right. There are exceptions, obviously, in Christie as well. There are a couple of very noticeable exceptions where the police are not quite on the side of right. But in general, it's simple. But nowadays, it's very unusual to find that. Mostly, you do have people struggling with aspects of the system and with the fact that it doesn't do always what you might think it should do or what people want it to do or what people visualizing it visualize it doing it's a complicated thing inherently yeah. and and struggling also with the problem that once you idealize that system at all once you say oh no no, no it is on the side of right it is on it is on the side of the angels and everyone involved is perfect then you've set up something you've set up an impossibility and you're preparing yourself for that whole system to break down. Because of course it's made up of human beings, like every system, and they are there are going to be bad human beings in there, like in any other. There's going to be systemic huge flaws, which there always are in any system, and the bigger the system, the bigger the flaws. There are going to be mistakes. And the minute you start idealizing it and say the detective must always be right, you're setting it up for a huge crash. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, you know, there's so much, I'm not going to do any spoilers, but there's so much wonderful stuff in, in your novel that, that connects to all that. But I want to talk a little bit about the craft elements, because one of the things, this is this your, this is your first third person? Yeah. And yeah. present tense third person, which is like mm -hmm. what, um, so that, um, what motivated that? Um, because I didn't really even think about it, I must admit, until after I finished. But, uh, <laughs> um, but that, you know, like how do you decide about that and, and what made you make those choices? Well, for me, the, I'm very character based as a writer. I think it's because I come from an acting background. It's the character who informs everything from the plot to the structure. So the character defines the structure and I had just come off writing Witch Helm, right? Which is an extremely interior narrative book. The main location of the action is inside the narrator's head. It's all about his inner workings, so much of the plot that I, everything takes place in there and with a lot of introspection. And I was, <laughs> I really wanted to write somebody who was all about just doing stuff. And we were not all up in his head. And when, the, when Cal came into my head, it was very much as a guy who defines himself by his actions, who really doesn't particularly think it matters what you think or you feel. Those aren't what define you. Who cares? What matters is what you do. And with him being this kind of guy, we didn't need, I didn't need the reader to be inside his head. He, as a narrator, didn't require 
the reader to be inside his head to know him. He only required the reader to see what he did in order to know him. So that distance of third person made more sense. If you're writing first person, you kind of have to let the reader inside the narrator's head to a huge extent. Otherwise, you know, what are you doing? And that would have gone against the grain of what Cal was about. So I had to make it third person. And again, because he's very, it's what you're doing right now. This is not about the past. It's, you know, it's one of the probably possibly the only one of my books where it's not about the interaction between past and present. Right. He's purely operating in the present and so present tense. It was the narrator defining the structure. That makes so much sense. And it is, I mean, that sort of leads to one of the other wonderful things about the book to me which is how much time we spend with Cal doing things, especially related to his house. And I love that because it's doing two things at once. I mean, first of all, it's just, it tells us a lot about Cal, his sort of commitment to detail, the things he will be free with, the things he won't, how he wants to create his home, how he wants to live. Um, but it's also weirdly building this sense of dread because there you do have this um um this sort of growing feeling was in what you read you can feel it already of um his sort of solitariness and his sort of the you know and his sort of sudden transplantedness and that um there, there he thinks he can control these physical objects but there's just this sense of well, what's coming that he can't control so i wonder if you gave any thought to you know how to um um you know the sort of choices to, to spend a lot of time on sort of essentially renovation right and repair <laughs> and um no, all of it feels so important but it must have you know like how did you discover that or was it now it just it just happened it kind of just happened again because i was focusing on this guy who was trying to reconstruct his sense of self and who was very much a man of action and it seemed to me that he would be doing that by working on fixing something fixing a home for himself finding somewhere not that he bought like all ready to go but that he rebuilt and redid and put back in working order himself. It, it, it seemed to me that at the point when the book starts, he would need to put something back in working order. And a house seemed like the obvious thing. And it also seemed like a good point of intersection between him and this 13 year old kid who shows up demanding, you have to find my big brother. My big brother's disappeared. You have to find him. It seemed to me that again this is another of the western tropes that keep showing up right is the two strangers who kind of find the, each other along some strange journey where they're both looking for something else and what happens to this odd chance relationship that's begun along the way i wanted to explore that and it seemed like this would be a good point because this is a kid whose father has gone off somewhere nobody's completely clear on where and they don't mostly hear from him and he's looking for i mean he thinks he's just looking for his brother but he's also looking for someone to show him how to grow up into someone who is capable of taking on the world, who has the practical skills to deal with this quite savage and brutal world that is out there. And it seemed to me that the idea of Cal showing him practical skills, showing him how to make things work, how to fix things, seemed to work well as a meeting point for them, as something for them to build a relationship over before they moved on to trying at least to fix more abstract things so when the house started off as, as a purely cal thing it seemed to make sense for the relationship between cal and trey too yeah no absolutely and it feels like sort of you know the it's the way they communicate through mm. through, through that and it, that felt so true and also it reminds me one of the other westerns that that the the book reminded me of a little bit was true grit and maybe in that in that relationship of the the young person and the older the older sort of past their prime and uh um and that's sort of a famously boise uh uh novel but it feels like a lot of the same themes it's um yeah were there any other westerns that you uh either novels or films that that snuck into your um your, your sort of vantage point as you were writing this well true grit there was definitely that element in there and i read lonesome dove that was the one that got oh, me hooked on yes. i 
great. Love it's Lonesome Dove and more modern levels, the Sisters Brothers. What I really liked about the Westerns and what I think did probably creep in there was that the relationships, like in True Grit that you just mentioned, can be very non-standard. Like they're very much defined by the individual characters themselves, because these are usually quite solitary people who run into each other when they're both looking for something else. And it's a very weird, isolated situation. And there are no real parameters for how they should manage this relationship. I mean, True Grit being the classic example, how are these two people supposed to establish any kind of relationship? being who they are and yet you know they need to get this thing done so they're going to have to establish some kind of relationship and so they base it purely on what they see in front of them they base it purely on what they know of each other and how they interact in the moment with no preconceptions no um just responding to what they get in the moment and i wanted to use that as well because all of the characters here cal because he's a total stranger he has no preconceptions he has no idea of how he's supposed to behave either he doesn't know how he should go about establishing a relationship so he just has to go on what he's given and the kid trey is is you know half feral anyway and has no idea how people establish relationships and is perfectly willing to go on what he's thrown so they're just kind of finding their way sentence by sentence. And that I think is something that shows up in an awful lot of Westerns and that I wanted to borrow. Yes, another making me, oh, here comes because, yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> so we should, I realized I was just thinking, oh my gosh, we had so many questions on the side that we should start to loop them in. Is that what, is that why you're here? <laughs> I mean, I have a lot. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's do it. So, um, I will talk as fast as I can, I promise. <laughs> I have a lot, and we can certainly, if it's okay with your schedule, go a few minutes over. Um, but I just, I didn't want to talk about it at all. It's just that we have a lot. Um, so I'm just going to go through these. I think you've hinted at a couple of them, but still, um, just because people like their questions getting asked. Um, so Kelsey says, uh, Tana, I'm always amazed by your characters. They feel like people who exist off the page long before the story starts and long after it ends. I'm wondering how you go about creating those characters. And then she said, I know this is a big abstract question, but any insight into your characterization? Oh, okay, so thank you so much because I really care about characterization. So to hear that totally makes my day and thank you. I mean, I think it helps that I come from an acting background because that is really good training for writing. It's kind of the same skill deep down because what you do as an actor is your job is you create this character as a real three-dimensional person. You let the audience see the whole story through the lens of this character's like needs and desires and fears. And you want them to go home feeling like they know this person inside out, and like they do their best friends. And it's basically the same thing when you're writing, if you write first person or, or close third person like this book. Like if you're describing a landscape, it's not just how it looks to me, the writer. It's what every bit of this means to that character at that moment in time. Or if I introduce another character, it's not like what I as the writer consider to be important. It's what would my main character, what my, would my point of view character consider to be important about this other character right now. Basically, I think acting is good practice in getting out of the character's way and letting as much as possible be about the character's needs rather than about yours. So, um, we had another question about how your acting informs your writing experience. So I'm going to consider that one answered. <laughs> there's that and there's also the fact that it really helps with dialogue because if I write a line of dialogue and I look at it and I go, I would not want to say that on stage. <laughs> that probably needs to change. Fair enough. Um, so we've covered your love of Westerns pretty well on here, but um, Lisa was wondering, she says to Hannah and Megan, I'm a big fan of both of you. Can you recommend some books you love? Megan, why don't you oh, go first? Oh my gosh, that's, that's a big one. <laughs> um, there's so many. Um, let's see. Well, I'll think of someone that I've read lately. Um, um, I can highly recommend, wait, wait, I don't want to recommend if McKenna, you don't carry it, but the Leave the World Behind, Ruman Alam's new book, which is very much a mystery, is, uh, which is just a finalist for the National Book Award, was, was one um, I've just read that's wonderful. Um, um, 
and you know, um, I'm sure. Gosh, I'm now I'm going blank on the all because this novels of all time or just lately. I, I think of all time, or you can do lately. You can you can answer them however you like. I do know that people like um, in these events. They like books that are a nice escape from the pandemic. Oh wait, well you know yes. Well, I, that's and let's stick with straight crime novels. I like I really love all of Laura Lippman's books, um, and I particularly love her standalones. But I, though I don't think you can go wrong with any of them. So she, I she's one who I I never miss a book. Um, same with Allison Galen. She is another favorite of mine. Um, Ace Atkins, uh, um, another one, um, and. Then his series is Quinn Colson series for those of you that love the series uh, those are some favorites of mine and I will go for um, okay these are the two that I'm just either buying for everybody or recommending to everybody is the Yiddish Policeman's Union by Michael Shaban which is okay it's a noir novel but it's this huge lyrical alternative history wildly original noir novel where um, Israel doesn't exist. Instead, there is a temporary Jewish homeland that's been set up in this little corner of Alaska. And in its last days, the kind of, you know, the battered maverick detective who always shows up in noir novel, he's investigating the murder of a chess prodigy turned heroin addict. And this book, it has everything. The writing is beautiful. He can make a character leap off the page with one sentence. He can turn from hilariously funny to deeply moving to really thought-provoking and insightful. Like he can turn on a dime and it's ridiculously original. So I am recommending that to absolutely everybody. And the other one I'm recommending is The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley, which is also kind of off genre and a mix of genres and strange. And it, it's Victorian London. And Nathaniel Stapleton is saved from a bomb blast by this mysterious watch that has appeared on his pillow. So he goes looking for the watchmaker who turns out to be this Japanese immigrant called Keita Mori with a mysterious past. And meanwhile, there's this kind of intense, studious woman called Grace Carroll, who is trying to avoid getting married and prove the existence of luminiferous ether. And this, their lives all get mixed up together and everything changes. And it's like, it's a thriller and it's a love story. And it's, it's, it's absolutely everything at once. And it has a clockwork octopus with a mind of its own. So you can't go wrong. So Jennifer would like to know, how have you both felt seeing your stories be interpreted on TV? And um, we'll start with you, Tana. Oh, um, well, I, I, you know, I ended up not actually seeing the TV series so far because, no, originally I was supposed to be involved because I, I thought it was going to be an adaptation of the book. So I was like, okay, yeah. But then it turned out that what they, they were planning on was a complete reimagination. And I went, man, I'm not going to be useful here. Nobody wants the author sitting in the corner going, eh, excuse me, it's not like that in the book. You know, that's just going to stress everybody out. So I went, okay, you guys know what you're doing. You do it. I will go and do what I actually know how to do. So I don't actually know how much resemblance it has to the books, but there are a lot of great actors involved, so you can't go too far wrong. But again, I haven't watched it yet because I was going, I am going to be that person sitting there going, that character wouldn't do that. And, you know, that's, that's no fun for anybody. Yeah, um, I I was the creator of mine, so I have only myself to blame. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, I it, you know, um, it was it, I find the incredible, exhausting, extraordinary experience, very stressful, kind of wonderful. I you know, I, I, I it, it makes me un, sort of you know, Tana, your experience in the theater and as an actress, I have so, it's it so enriched my appreciation for the, the process and for actors and for um, the camaraderie and collaboration of a crew and a group. It, it was really, you know, novelists, it, we lead a very solitary existence. And there, I mean, it was on, it's been unforgettable uh, being able to collaborate with so many people um, and bring it to fruition. So, um, so I'm, I'm very glad to have done it. Uh, but I think um, it, with other people adapting my stuff, I think I do what Tana did, <laughs> just, maybe just wait it out. <laughs> that seems yeah. stressful. 
Yeah, I think I'm the last per you're probably the I'm probably the last person who should ever see it because that's all I'm gonna see is For sure. Time. It would be very stressful. Yeah, absolutely. But do you know if there are more of the Dublin Murder Squad? Is there gonna be another series? Uh, I don't know yet. I think everything's kind of upside down with the pandemic and they haven't, like, they, they have the option on the other books that they got the option on, on the whole lot of them. But I don't know whether they're going to take it up or not, because, I mean, I don't even know how you would begin to film anything right now. You, you would have to, like, test everybody every day and have every single scene, including the love scenes, happen at a two metre distance. I don't know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I know that uh, Michael Connolly posted that Bosch is filming, and as soon as um, a, a, as soon as the scene ends, everyone puts their mask back on. But I think they've made a quarantined bubble so that they can safely do what needs to be done. But then they're still wearing masks in between um, when possible. But it's it's a yeah. lot. I mean, I can't imagine the difficulties. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, Rebecca would like to know, she says, uh, Tana and Megan, love both of you. You're two of my favorite writers. Both of you write such incredible character-driven mysteries. When you go about crafting your novels, do you start with the character first or the mystery? And how do you go about unraveling your complex mysteries for yourselves as you write them? Megan, you can go first this time. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's hard. Um, I, it's fun. I, call, I wouldn't say I never have the plot to start, um, but I often will have the situation before I have the character. Um, I'll, you know, I'll have a particular pressure cooker thing, but then if I can't find the character, then then I throw the whole thing out. So, so I may begin with... Um, um, a crime, um, for instance, um, not the mystery itself, but the crime. And then I have to find my point of view. And if I, that bo if I can't get that voice where I can hear it in my head, then, then it goes away. Once I can get it in my head, then I kind of make, figure out the plot from there. Um, I think that's usually my process. Would you ever go back to it? Like if the character comes to you a few years later and you go, oh, that's the character for that idea that I had. Would you ever go back to it and pick it up? I think I did go back to one novel that I have abandoned. I have about six or seven that I haven't gone back to, but I did do it once and I think I had, I didn't quite, um, I may have even switched from first to third or third to first, which I often do too. So that's especially why I was interested in your case because it, it does, uh, sometimes the key is that you've got the right character, but you've got the wrong, um, you know, point of view, distance. Yeah, I start with the character. I mean, I, that's, that's kind of the core thing for me. And then by the time I start working it, I'll have like a core location as well, usually, and the b very basic premise. But I don't have anything else. I'm just diving in and hoping there's a book somewhere. And I really envy and am kind of in awe of the writers who've got it all plotted out and have it like the full outline in the notebook. The outlines, oh my God. So but they know there's a book there. They're so lucky. They know they're not going to be there, you know, 400 pages later going, what was I thinking again? <laughs> but I reckon because I'm so character-based, I've got to get to know the characters for a while before I figure out who might have done what to whom and for what reasons. So I've got to write them for a while before I've got anything like a plot. So again, I'll have a basic premise. Like this time I had the retired cop and the kid who's going, you have to find my brother. But that was basically all I had. And I've had the same thing where you suddenly realize sometimes that you're looking at the book from the wrong point of view and you're going to have to rearrange the combination of character and plot. You suddenly go, that's not this person's book. That might be somebody else's book. Yeah. Um, what happens when you, what happens when you actually have a day when it's just not clicking? Do you just backtrack until you know where things went wrong? How do you get out of that? I go for really, 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 really long walks until something goes click in my head and it makes sense again. But it's what you were saying about this being such a solitary profession. I'm used to acting where if you're having one of those days where you're just crap, somebody else is going to throw you something like one of the other actors or the director will go, try it this way or, oh, oh, can we try the scene like this? And suddenly your brain's working again. But when you're writing, it's just you. So yeah, long walks. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I used to go to the movies, but now I can't. So, uh, so, but that is the same notion as taking a walk, which I do do as well. But you kind of shake your head, try and shake your head up, right? Yeah. Oh, so I think you answer the are you plotters or panthers? Uh-huh. Wanting to um, elaborate though, do you do you know the end of the book? A lot of people don't know how they're going to get there, but they know the ending. No, I have no idea. I don't know who done it. I don't know why they did it. And it means that I get to about two thirds of the way through the book usually and go, oh my God, that person <laughs> did what? And then I have to go back and kind of rewrite, like, damn it, they're all chapters two and three aren't going to work now. I'm going to have to rewrite the whole of that to make that shift and fit into place. But I kind of, I mean, I know I complain about the fact that it takes rewriting, but I kind of hope that what it means is that because there's that sense of surprise and revelation to me along the way, I sort of hope that a bit of it filters through to the reader where you suddenly go, all oh, those bits fit into place and of course it has to be this way, but I never saw that. So I hope that filters through. That's how your books feel to me. It feels like both surprising and inevitable, which is like always what you want. I, I love that. So whatever you're doing, it's working out. <laughs> Thank you. What do you do? Or do you know the ending? I know you? the ending in very big, like like the three word ending. You know, I know like some, but I don't know anything else about how we get there, or how it will feel. And I've sometimes changed it. So I'm not, not that far afield from you. Uh, but I, yeah, I have some kind of um, point to work towards, even if I then don't end up there. <laughs> Weirdly, I usually end up having the final paragraphs of the book done when I'm about halfway through it. Oh. I don't always know how I'm going to get there, but I'll have the last couple of paragraphs mm-hmm. in my head and just sort of wander over in that direction. <laughs> and think, yeah, see where it takes me. We already talked about um, kind of the role of the police, but um, Emily has a question. She really loves how gently, persistently the novels ask the question, what are the police even for? It also seems incredibly prescient and relevant to our world today. Were these conscious themes you wanted to approach through writing? How did you grapple with them throughout the writing process? I I know that you've already kind of answered that, but not throughout the writing process. Yeah, they they weren't really themes that I went in intending to deal with. But again, as I got more into the Western thing, it became obvious that because Westerns are so deeply entangled with the idea of morality and how do we decide what's right and wrong? How do we find right and wrong in a world where these are really not simple and where right somehow doesn't seem to be available? It kind of became obvious that it had to be, that had to be a presence not only in the issues he was dealing with right there in the village, but also in whatever had driven him to that village. So I had it worked into his relationship with his family, with his wife and his grown up daughter. But then it became obvious that there also had to be a layer within his relationship with his job and dealing with, I mean, being police is inherently to do with right and wrong. So he had to be dealing with, what, yeah, what, exactly how you ask the question, what is this job for? What is it meant to do and why, is it not doing it? His line is something like, um, he, he realizes that one, of, one or the other of them, him or the job, can't be trusted. It took a lot of working in and reworking and reworking and reworking, I have to say that part, before I got it to a point where I was going, this kind of is saying roughly what he would in fact be going to. Because one reason it took so much, right, is because I'm in Ireland and our entire everything about our police and their relationship with the community is completely different from what you have in America. Just to take a really like obvious example, they're called, the name is the Garda Shikana, which means the guardians of the peace. That's the model in which they're supposed to be based. Now I'm not saying it always works that way. Of course it doesn't. Like we said, systems have every problem that systems have, but it's a different perception of what it is. And on, on another really basic level, they don't carry guns. So the entire relationship between police and community is based on entirely different premises. So I kind of did a lot of, in the writing process, I did an awful lot of reading internet forums for American policemen, just to get a sense of what the difference is between American police officers. What's the mentality there? What what are the things they're thinking about? A lot of research. So I think this actually can apply to both authors. So Lori was wondering 
if you've ever considered doing a true crime novel for a different perspective. Well, not novel, true crime. Yeah, yeah I know. You <laughs> I don't, for one thing, it would involve an awful lot of research. <laughs> even like I did a certain amount of research obviously for these books but that's an awful lot of research and that's a, that's a lot of research but also I, I I like having the freedom to make up the characters and the plots I don't think I would necessarily do as good a job when they were already established and I had to work with that what do you reckon Megan have you ever I would love to do one, but I also have that same problem. And also, I don't really like to talk to people that I don't know and ask them uncomfortable questions, which I always feel like you'd have to do if you uh, uh, murder true crime. No, I, um, I am doing a true crime TV project now. And so it's the first time I've had to deal with just the thing you're talking about, like where you want to in invent something to solve this problem, but, but you can't. Um, and But you still have to kind of imagine your way into things and it's making me realize why I, it was probably great that I never wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah people the real lives and real people aren't dramatically they don't fit into dramatically satisfying shapes do they they really don't. <laughs> there's not a lot of symmetry there's not a lot of you know I mean, <laughs> um you know, and it th things, you know, are really messy in a way that I think we as novels both love, but need to sort of create some kind of coherence to. It's one reason I write mysteries, I have to admit, is that they've got such a, a clean arc. Like A kills B, C finds out who did it. That's, yeah. with, with huge variations, of course, but that's the basic shape of your book. I reckon it's because, like, I write long to begin with. And I think if I didn't have that structure there to put some manners on me, I'd still be there 200,000 words later going, it'll be done sometime. I just can't tell whether it's finished yet. And, you know, we need that shape. The, the shape of fiction is a good one. So, Allison was wondering, how do you decide to change main characters for every book? Uh, I read, she read, In the Woods and was so obsessed with what happened to Rob and then we never got to see any more of him. Ah, right, okay. I was coming to the end of In the Woods and I was thinking, wow, if somebody actually buys this and publishes it someday and if people read it, they might, who knows, want another one. And I was going, okay, the standard thing with series is to follow the one main character through the ups and downs, like the kind of minor ups and downs of life. And I love reading those series, but I realized I didn't really want to write one because In the Woods was about this huge turning point in this guy's life, where what he decides is going to define the, the course of the rest of his life. And I, wa I wanted to write about those moments. I wanted to write about, you know, for detectives, the case where the barrier between personal and professional breaks down. And this is a crossroads. This is one of the great crossroads of their lives. And you can't, keep throwing someone into great big crossroads every year or two when you need a new book, they'll, they'll have lost their minds by book three. And I think my only other option was to switch narrator. And I suddenly realized I like looking at things from different perspectives. To me, that's one of the core things about any of the arts is they give you a glimpse into the fact that other people have different perspectives and these are fascinating and vital and real and valid. And I had a kind of vague idea as well about the idea of a detective showing up in a murder scene to find that the murder victim looks exactly like her, but she knows she's not a twin and what the hell. And I realized that the, the second lead from In the Woods, Cassie Maddox, who has a complicated relationship with her own past and with sense of identity, might be the perfect person to do that. That idea might thematically be a really good match for her and from there it sort of went it sort of moved on from there finding a character oh I'd like to see what the world looks like from this person's viewpoint or oh I kind of I've got this character here and there's also this odd thing that I saw that gave me an idea and that's a perfect match it's sort of followed on book by book I like the idea of seeing the same world from different viewpoints and seeing how different it looked So I think we are just about to time. I have a couple, um, I have one more question um, because I always like to give the people who agree to moderate these 
a chance to talk about their books really quickly. We actually have a question from Daphne. Megan, can you tell us about next year's book, which I was already oh. going to ask about? Um, and then uh, anything else you want to say about yourself and your book? Um, yeah, I do. I can't believe I have another book coming out for last. Um, the, it's called The Turnout. And it's about um, two sisters who run a ballet school. Um, and uh, one of them becomes involved with um, a man, a disreputable man. <laughs> Um, and things go awry. Uh, so, uh, but it's set in this sort of hot house world of ballet, which I, you know, I just had to wait a few years from Black Swan before I could finally, I've been waiting to write my ballet book for some time. Um, and this is it. Um, so it's sort of this psychosexual ballet sister thing. <laughs> it's, um, um, yes, and that will come out in June, I think. I think for June, and it sounds like the book any way I can have it on I can't wait. <laughs> like, can't wait to see it out. Um, so uh, a couple just logistics announcements. So as I said, we have signed book plates if you wanted to order um, an additional book. And um, if you missed the beginning of this, uh, if you missed the end, you're not on here hearing my announcement, but we will be sending out um, links to this on YouTube in the next day or two. So it'll be available for private viewing for the ticket holders. Um, in case you missed it or you want to rewatch any anything, um, we'll get another email out to you shortly. Um, we'll be back on with a private event with um, Lisa Jewell and Ruth Ware tomorrow, and then uh, we'll be on Facebook Live with John Grisham um, on Friday. So, a couple days coming up. I just want to thank everyone for uh, being here with us today, especially Tana French and Mag Megan Abbott. It's been an absolute pleasure. Wonderful as I knew it would be. So um, thank you both very much, and everyone have a wonderful day. Ah, thank, thank you. you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Great time. Oh, I, I did it all for the early book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye, everyone. Thank you so much, guys, and thanks for having me, McKenna. It's been a pleasure. Good to see you both again. Bye. Nice to see you.